Now, I've learned that sometimes, actually, slow is better than fast. And you go, I know, you're going, no way. Fast is so much more efficient, right? We like everything fast in our culture, but here's the thing. If efficiency is not what God is trying to do in our life, you're like, what do you mean? What if God is looking to build quality? You go, well, what do you mean by that? Well, imagine this. How many people here, if we could, you know, now we have the iPhone, you could just tape yourself during traffic. The things that come out of your mouth. I mean, when I'm stuck in traffic, I turn into a different person. Or maybe I just turn into the person I really am when I'm not managing everything in my life, right? I'm unedited because I'm alone in the car or people are with me sometimes. And the road rage takes place because I feel like fast is better than what? Than slow. I mean, I don't understand it logically. Traffic makes no sense absolutely at all because it hinders my efficiency. I want to get from point A to point B fast as I can convenient as I can, comfortable as I can, because I deserve it. Why? I don't know. But I do. I deserve it. So when, when, you know, especially when one time this grandma, I was driving in Staten Island on Toad Hill. It's a very, you know, curvy road and says 20 miles per hour. And this grandma was driving 20 miles per hour. <laughs> what is wrong with her? Everybody knows that you're supposed to drive at least 10 to 15 miles up the speed limit. That's allowed. I'm late. I, I, had to ha I had a meeting. I had to be there in 15 minutes. And this grandma was getting in my way. And I was just like, oh my gosh, when I'm old, I'm going to drive fast. <laughs> and you know, I I'm not going to do that to people. And you know, there's a lot of other things I said that you don't want to know. But don't trip. God's working on me still. What if in, during traffic in our lives, it doesn't make sense to the destination we need to, logically, it doesn't aid us at all. But spiritually, there is reason, good reason why God allows traffic to take place, things to jam up our life. The Bible says that God refines us in our trials and tribulation. And trials are usually jammed up situations where you're stuck. And you know it could be quicker, but it's excruciatingly <laughs> slow. And it's annoying and painful as heck. We become impatient. And what happens in trials of our lives, in the traffic of our lives, is our character, our heart, is exposed. Now. We're going to Exodus 32. Let's go there. We see this impatience in them. It's also in us. Right? How many people here are really patient? <laughs> how, many, how, how many people here are saints? You know, when people cut you off during traffic, they're like, God bless you. <laughs> I, Jesus told me to forgive my enemies, and I love you. How many people want to kill the other person? I do. That's why I need Jesus. But the truth is, we're extremely impatient. And God, the Bible says that God refines us in the process of these trials of our life, where things are slower than normal, to show us our impatience. Because impatience points to something very important you need to understand if the gospel is going to penetrate there. Impatience says something about humanity. Impatience in this passage says something about the people of God. Impatience is about entitlement. Impatience is about crazy assumptions. And we're going to that in a minute. So as we tackle this text, this is a question I'm going to answer. Where is Jesus in our impatience? Because look at the person to your left and right. Keep doing that. They'll get, they'll get annoyed at you. They'll be like, why are you looking at me? Why are you looking at me strange? Everyone here in this room, including me, 
struggles with impatience because we think we have these crazy assumptions. We think we're entitled to peace. We're entitled to the perfect life, entitled to no traffic, a beautiful day, a great day. We think we're entitled to that. But that's just a crazy assumption. We'll see. Well, when we read this passage, Exodus 32, we know that God has delivered Israel from slavery, and now they have God has purchased their freedom from his power, and they've just been free for a little bit. And just like kids, when you give them freedom, you know, when you see movies, kids, when their parents go away, they throw big parties. Well, when you read this passage, you should get that in your mind. Too much freedom is dangerous. But when you come here, look at the attitude as a mirror that we all share here. Watch this impatience. Now, when the people saw that Moses was what? Let's, let's read this together. When, when the, don't read this part. When the people saw that Moses was so long. How many people ever say that? It takes so long. My son says, says that to me every time we drive. It takes so long. And it's just been two minutes. <laughs> it takes so long. And the people of God here, you know, Moses went up to meet God for direction for their destiny. And the people saw that, meaning a crowd gathered, and it was so long in coming down from the mountain that they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses, I know Moses just led them into freedom. He's like William Wallace times 10. But, you know, screw him. He's taking so long. I mean, the... The ingrained part of humanity here, you see it as a mirror, is an amazing impatience. And they're mad about it. I mean, how long was he up there? The text doesn't tell us, but not very long. They're just like, oh, they were getting restless by waiting. How many people get restless when you wait? Okay. <laughs> I see your hand. In Asian churches, they just... Raise their hand. They don't say amen. <laughs> so only I know. I'm with you. <laughs> Lord, we pray for diverse. <laughs> I mean, that's why. Okay, let me go with this. <laughs> that says, um, so, and uh, for this fellow Moses who brought us out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to them, to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. And now he's going to make a golden cow. Now why? Why are these people, why are they so angry about the velocity of God's presence or work in their life? I mean, you know they were enslaved for about 500 years, right? That's five centuries in Egypt. And God delivered them, like, in seven days. That's pretty fast. That's, like, better than high speed. That's, like, T1. I mean, seriously, that's real velocity. But they, why are they so upset? Well, here, here it is. A lot of us, and like them, we have these crazy assumptions about our life. Just because we have something, we think it's, it's mine. I should have it. I, it's mine. I should have it. I should have this quality of life. I should have peace and quiet. Don't have kids then. That is thrown out the window. And I believe God uses children in humanity to teach them there is no such thing as owning anything. And especially tranquility is thrown out the window. When a kid asks you, are we there yet, 50 billion times, your tranquility is done. What is peace? I have no idea what that means. But we, we, we have these crazy assumptions. And why? Why? Because they were simply entitled to their time. They felt like they should have a God that does everything for them, like before. It was an assumption. They should have their leader at any moment's notice. When they don't like something, they should be able to complain. It was entitlement in them. And it's a crazy assumption to think that you des deserve something that you never earned. It was grace all along, but they think they deserve it. And they go, well, I'm not, I'm not a slave anymore. I'm free for mutiny. 
to cross God out if I don't like what he's doing. That's, that's the concept of democracy. You know that, right? We live in a democratic society. You think you're entitled to freedom to vote like your vote matters. I know we do that in advertisement campaigns. Your vote matters. You're entitled to that. You know, democracy comes from John Locke's principle that when you don't like the ruler, you could throw him out. That's the bedrock foundation of democracy. So we think that we deserve this and that. Do we really? Yeah, I deserve the perfect life. I deserve, I mean, people complain about having, you know, I'm wearing Gap. That's not good enough. I mean, we have brands after brands after brands, and I'm not speaking against materialism. I'm wearing Ralph Lauren. All right, I'm in the conversation there. But, but there are degrees of things that we think the quality of our life should be. Right? Why is that? Entitlement. Our impatience comes from entitlement. You're like, you know, you ever get really impatient with someone? Well, what starts happening? You go, oh! You start getting frustrated because you think that should not be happening. Like, for example, I went to the Hamptons a couple of weeks ago, and, and, and I see this in my son, and he's four. I see it really bad. So we were having a lot of fun. He thinks he's entitled to fun. And, and let me just tell you, you're like, Pastor Sam, please don't tell me we're not entitled to fun. That would suck. <laughs> he thinks he's entitled to fun 24 hours a day. That's the problem. He was having fun. It, it became 9.30. 9.30 is when what? If you want to have more fun, you got to sleep. Because if you don't sleep, I'm not going to have fun tomorrow. Well, my wife's not going to have fun tomorrow because you're going to be cranky. You're going to be throwing stuff. You're going to be angry. He's going to be agitated. So I wanted to, as a father, a good, loving, hearted father. Gosh, I'm a great father. And, you know, I, and I'm like, Nathan, it's time to sleep, 930. Now, when you tell a four-year-old that's, that's in a candy shop, that's having so much fun with the people he loves, he thinks there is nothing better than that. And sleep is like Satan. He wants to cast me out in Jesus' name. And he would, too. He knows how to do that. He's always praying. And, and I told him, it's time to sleep. I do not want, I think it was a mistake for me to do it. I should have set my wife. And, and I said, it's time to sleep. And he said, no. And I said, who, who made you boss, right? And he goes, daddy, this is not your playhouse. The four-year-old is very sinful. I mean, smart is not good sometimes. He goes, this is not your playhouse. This is Tay's playhouse. So Tay is the boss, not you. So go. <laughs> I mean, really, is this really happening? And I go, I don't care. I am still bigger than you. <laughs> This might not be my playhouse, but I was just like, this, this is when Eastern philosophy works. And Western philosophy, raising kids might not work here. Eastern will, you know? And um, I, I grabbed him and I said, I do not care. You are going to bed, and if you keep acting this way, you're gonna be sleeping all weekend. <laughs> and he looks at me, and he starts to cry. So I try to console him because I'm a good, loving father. But he bites me. <laughs> I still have a mark right here. And, he, and he's in fascinated and obsessed with dinosaurs. So he bites me like a dinosaur. And I have the mark here. I was shocked because, when, because he felt entitled to his fun. And when I got in his way of it, it was mutiny. It was treason. I don't care about you. I want what I want. He grew impatient and restless and acted out. That's what the people of God did in this passage, isn't it? That's what a lot of people do that get faith. And you don't even need to be 
A seeker, this is when people get faith, you really realize the effed upness, the wickedness of our lives and who we are in our soul and how black and how dark we are is that when, we, when God's been good to us and saved us and delivered us, we still think we're entitled to this life. And we can't see, we're blinded by the fact that it is an ultimatum with God in us most of the time. We think that if God, if God doesn't do this, what, what my plans are, and he doesn't bless this, then you know what? I'm going to stop following. I'm going to go sin. And we feel like we have the right to sin because he's not doing what I want. Last time I checked, then you're God. And I'm God. That's the problem here. So where is Jesus in what? In our impatience. Well, first, what we learn from this passage is what? He's trying to expose some of our, of our what? Crazy, Crazy assumptions. <clears throat> Listen, the gospel does not say that God's gonna, God is a genie. That's why sometimes slow is better than fast. Because why God is putting us in the refiner's fire, there are situations in your life right now that is really annoying. Amen? You're like, yeah, come on, I don't know why God's, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. Why is God putting me in this situation? Uh, he's trying to teach you. If you think you deserve a perfect life, it's crazy. He's not interested in what you want. He's interested in what? What we Need. Rolling Stones, smart people. He's more interested in what you need than what you want because he's a father. The motif of God being a father comes out in this passage so vividly. He is gracious. And that's why as we go down to this passage, let's go down. I want you to think about this. Where are the places in your life right now where you are the most impatient about. You're like, okay. And I pray God will show you. Because people think they're entitled to things. Like, where's my husband? Where's my wife? Because I'm entitled to the perfect husband, perfect wife. No, you're not. I know you. You're not perfect in any way. Because you, you, we're entitled. Where, where, where is the places in your life where you're impatient? And you know what? You're going to enter the refiner's fire, these traffic jammed places, jammed up places, where God is trying to expose your entitlement. Am I entitled? And he's trying to show you that you don't deserve that. If anyone deserves anything, it's not us. What do we deserve? I want you to look at yourself, look at the person next to you, don't stare at them, they might get annoyed, which might be a good thing because God might be working on their life, but what do you really deserve? I mean, are you really that good? You're like, oh, yeah, no. Then why do you think you deserve? I don't know. If anyone deserves the right to do anything in this passage, is this. God says, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are stiff-necked people, now they leave me alone, so that my anger may what? Burn against them, and then I may destroy them, and then I will make you into a great nation. God says, you know what? I'm fed up. Let's just wipe them out. I feel like that all the time. And then I see my son and go, oh, he looks like me. And I forgive him and love him. But there are times, if anyone had the right here in this passage, if anyone is entitled, is God to do what? To say, you know what? You're not grateful for all the things I've done for you, who I am for you. You know what? Forget it. But he does it, doesn't he? What happened? Moses talked, talks him out of it. And then the Lord, what? <coughs> then the Lord relented relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had and the threatened. And of course, we're going to go into this passage deeper in the next couple of weeks. But today, I want to focus on this issue, why God did not 
give up on his people. Why God didn't just wipe them out and start again? When they are the epitome of wickedness and, and selfish brat entitlement stuff, why, why didn't he just give up? Well, simple. The only reason he didn't give up is because, and people might say here, oh, because he loves us. That's very vague. Oh, yeah, I'm so great. That's why he loves No, that's not why. God stopped that because he's great. He's gracious. This says more about him than us. Amen? God is awesome. He's good. That's the only answer here. Now, if you think about it, if you read this passage from a Western mind, you're not going to really understand this passage because God looks like a dictator. Like, oh, I'm going to kill you, you know? I'm going to imperialize. I want you to worship me. It just looks like he's trying to enslave people and by fear. But if you're from the Eastern mindset, which Mesopotamia is, and the Middle East is Asia, right? This is why I say Jesus is Asian. It's true. This is the continent. This is Eastern, Middle Eastern philosophy. Now, if you're from the Western world, Russell Pierce became famous for this, right? He says that in the Western world, how kids are raised is that, you know, you give them timeouts. And Russell Pierce says, I don't understand what timeouts are. Like, what does a timeout do? Timeout. You're, Jimmy, you're being real bad. Timeout. He's like, what? You, you don't get in trouble? You get to freeze time? That's cool. <laughs> you know? And then if you're being really bad, it's timeout two. And timeout three. And after timeout three, is I'm taking your cell phone away. <laughs> Fine, here. And then the kid calls his mom a bitch. That's it. No TV for a week. And Russell Peters says he never understood the Western mindset of raising kids. He goes, what does that do? And if you actually threaten to beat them, 911, Child Protective Services. And Russell Peters said he tried that to his dad, his Indian dad. And his dad replied, you're going to get a hurting real bad. <laughs> he goes, I'm going to call the cops. He goes, you will be dead by then. <laughs> I will go to jail, and you will go to jail. And you know, they're being serious. An Eastern mindset, your parents don't love you if you have not been hurt. <laughs> parents are very interested in who you become. In the, there is no timeouts, just knockouts. <laughs> I'm serious. I grew up in Korea, and it's knockouts, not timeouts. There is no such thing as timeout. You know next time not to steal. I mean, me, I learned the hard way. I came to the state, so I got kind of confused. I told my parents, I can call the cops on you. Because we don't, and they say, I don't care. I will kill you before that. And this seems like abuse, but you don't know me. I mean, I stole all the money in the house all the time from first to third grade. And they would beat, and, and you know, some, some things I don't remember because I got knocked out. <laughs> but let me tell you, my mom just over and over again to beat me into submission. At third grade, I thought, I don't think it's worth dying over $20. <laughs> I got pretty smart. I don't think it's worth it anymore. And then I understood later on that he's, they're disciplining me because they don't want to. And, and she told the same story over and over again every time I stole about a man going to jail. And I thought, I can't go to jail right now. I'm a minor. You see, you see that? You see that darkness? Why is my mom going out of her way? Does she like to beat me? You're like, maybe. No. <laughs> it's because of love. If you read this passage carefully and you go down to 32 and 33, that we're going to spend more time next week on, you see that God doesn't destroy Israel. God actually sends a plague. If you go to Hebrews. The Bible says that God only disciplines those who he loves. If you're a legitimate son, legitimate daughter, in the Eastern mindset, you don't get away with this stuff. If you're in the Western mindset, you go, come on, just give a timeout. That's not going to work, is it? In the Eastern mindset, God disciplines, and I don't know, be creative with the word discipline in your life. 
But right now, if you're stuck in traffic, you're in situations over and over again that annoy you, that drive you crazy, that bring out the worst in you, good. That's God, what God's trying to show you. That's what God is trying to show that he's trying to save you from. He doesn't as, as much care where you end up in your life and destination and what you do, what your job is. He cares more about who you're becoming. And if he's a good father, he's going to want to He's going to want you to become what? The best of who you're meant to be. Right? So where is Jesus in our impatience? Well, lastly, he's seriously what? Than he should be. My mom was seriously more patient patient than she should be. I remember in the third grade she said, I'm going to ship you back to Korea. That's when I said, oh, this is not good. But she put up with me stealing like, once a week, twice a week, for like three years. I still didn't get it. She could have just said, you know what, this guy is done, this guy is done. No, he just, she kept beating me. And I was stubborn, you know. Until finally I said, ah, this, this is not good. I need to learn this lesson. I need to get this. I want you to look in your life right now. God is extremely patient with those who he loves. Look into your life. Where are the areas of impatience, like I asked before? What is God trying to teach you about our assumptions? What is he trying to show you about him? Today, I want to pray that God would give you vision to see how good he is in your life because he drives you crazy in these situations. He sends these trials to our life so that we can become the best of him. He cares about us and loves us. And remember, God cares more about what we need than what we want. Because he wants the best for us. Amen? Let's stand and pray together. Let's lift our hands to the Lord and surrender. Father, I want to pray for the areas of great frustration in our lives currently. I want to pray for uh, the areas of our lives where we're just not happy with what you're doing. And there are areas where we rebel and, and commit treason. And when we say, well, if you're not going to do it, I'm going to do it my, my way, myself, and rebel against you. Father, I want to pray that we don't become people that just use God for our advantage, but we become people that fall in love with God. Father, I pray today that Jesus just wouldn't be a person that did something for us on the cross, but we would see, we would be given revelation to see who he is, what type of person he is to do that. And I just want to say that as we pray today until we have revelation of who Jesus is and more than what he's done we will never change our life because human beings are simply impatient and entitled and consumeristic by nature so today father I want to repent on behalf of all of us for being so impatient so entitled, so selfish to think that we deserve what you've given us by grace. And we just want to thank you right now for the trials in our life. Will you thank the Lord today? Not complain right now. You might complain tomorrow. God knows. That's the relationship where kids complain. But today, will you just look into your life and thank God for the trials in your life? He sends them because he cares for us. He sends them so that we can be refined and become the best of who we are in Christ. Right now, in Jesus' name.
thank you that throughout scripture you tell us that the father disciplines you discipline us enough to understand that you are in control of our life even though God we're stubborn and blind to the narcissism and to the selfishness that a lot of us possess <laughs> Thank you that you continue to refine us in the fire of the trials of our lives. Jesus, we thank you that in our patience, that you are really patient. And that tells us more about you than us. We thank you that you are good, that you're a loving Father, and that you will forever in our life guide us and lead us Today, God, we want to just worship you. Father, we worship you for being such a good father to our life. Because you will not settle for any, any less than the best of who we can become. Because that is the gospel. We are legitimate sons and daughters of God. We thank you for teaching us lessons that will change our life for the better and for the best. In Jesus' name we pray. Give the Lord a clap offer to the Lord. Can you see it? As you know, um, it's we have small groups all throughout the city during the week. I've, I've been hearing that a lot of more people have been joining small groups here. And I just want to say that I, I believe that God is once again blowing the wind of people meeting Jesus in a fresh way. So uh, I want you to really pray for God, for our friends and our family members to be able to meet Jesus maybe for the first time or again through our services, through our YouTube, you know, YouTube sermons, through small groups, because I believe God is doing that again. So as we pray today and in, in close, um, really keep that in prayer and, and pray for small groups, for the Burgess and for people on the verge to meet God and join God's family again. And I think that's really important. Second, um, know that at 11, around 11, 10, 11, 15, you can come to, the, to service in the city and pray. It's called the House of Prayer. Amin is usually here, and my wife comes um, to pray for the service, to pray for whatever reflection. I think that one of the things I feel as I pray for our church is that some of us are journaling a lot. Um, and that's, that discipline is great. But uh, prayer is absolutely necessary. And some people, I think, might be lacking power because they're lacking prayer. And that's not just an assumption. I'm just saying that that's something perhaps you want to consider, that prayer is lacking in your life. And therefore, there are certain things you can't push through. Lastly, uh, remember, we don't collect offering during service. We uh, Take offering online, 180church.tv, and most of our members give there. Thank you for being faithful with your tithes. Um, if, you're, if you're new, you can tithe outside in, in the info booth. There's envelopes and offerings there. So let's pray, and we'll wrap this up and give it to God. Father, we come before you today. We want to thank you for the, for the work you're doing in our life today. And we want to pray, God, that uh, in, in the trials and in the refinery of the places that you're trying to change in our life. I pray, God, you would give us the grace to be able to see what you're trying to do as you show us our impatience, as you show us of our entitlement, as you're trying to bring out the best in us. We thank you sometimes you bring out the worst in us so we can be motivated to change as we see that in your life. So Holy Spirit, will you continue to guide us for that? And secondly, Lord, I want to pray for small groups in, in our churches, in our church, and I just want to pray, God, that uh, you would begin to draw people to meet you personally and, and experience your grace where we might be, and people might join the family of God again. And Lord, we thank you for uh, the resources you've given us as we give back to you this week to carry out our mission. We thank you so much that more people could hear about who you are. So, Lord, we thank you for today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you soon.